senior member of St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, and former <coughs> director general of the European Co Commission. During his career in Brussels in the European Commission from 1933 to 2006, he worked in agricultural policy, foreign affairs, enlargement, management, and the cabinets of the presidents and other commissioners. His last post was as a director for strategy, coordination, and analysis in the Directorate General for External Relations. He has been a visiting professor at the College of Europe, my colleague, fellow at the Robert Schumann uh, Center for Advanced Study at the European uh, University Institute Florence, and fellow at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. He is a senior advisor at the European Policy Center, Brussels, honorary member of the board of Trans-European Policy Studies Association, of which he was Secretary General from 2006 to 2008, and practitioner fellow of the Sussex European University. Uh, Professor uh, Avery. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it was my first visit to Serbia, my first visit to Belgrade. Fantastic city, thank you very much. And I'd like also to say particularly a big thanks to Gwen Rackage, who I met last year in Florence, and he was the one who suggested about coming here. Um, can you read the screen at the back? Can you hear me? Okay, because um, I'm going to show a number of texts, what, what, I, what I'm going to put on the screen, but I'm not going to read the text. I'm going to comment on it and use it as a reference. Um, the things which I want to address to you today are not exactly what is mentioned in the program. Uh, the program says that I'm speaking about democracy in the accession process, but in fact um, I'm speaking about what it says in the biographical notes and abstracts, which is a wider theme than just democracy. I want to examine with you some of these basic questions. Um, uh, why the European Union has undertaken these successive enlargements, uh, and so on. There's been a lot of demands recently by politicians in the European Union for a debate on the final frontiers of the European Union. Sarkozy, on, on several occasions, has been to such a debate. And it was quite associated with the discussions about the Constitutional Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty. Some argue we can't define a constitution for the European Union unless we know what its limits are. Well, per person, I never really agreed with that. When we take the American Constitution, it was rather well defined long before uh, the United States took its present form. Anyhow, this debate on the future limits, although it's often demanded, has never taken place. And I sometimes feel I'm practically the only Brussels practitioner who's prepared to discuss and examine this. Um, of course, one of the reasons why the debate hasn't taken place is that for some politicians, possibly Sarkozy, uh, the debate on fixing the final frontiers of the European Union is a code for saying no to Turkey. Um, but I'll come to that in a minute. While we're looking at this map of the existing European Union, I'm, I'm going to say a little more, a bit more about myself. Um, uh, I've worked in the Commission, as you said, for 33 years, and I'm still alive. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not an academic, I'm a practitioner, or an ex-practitioner, and indeed I'm not a political scientist. I studied Latin and Greek at university, which is a very good basis for everything. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm a philosopher, but that's also a terminological <laughs> question. But I don't know how many of you have visited the Bodleian Library in Oxford, Oxford is my university, but, but Thomas Bodley put up this commemorative stone outside the Bodleian Library in which he dedicated it to the Res Publica Literatorum. You have to remember at the time Latin was the common language of scholarship, and I've always considered myself a member of the Res Publica Literatorum, the Republic of Scholars. During my career in the public space, I always try to keep in touch with the thinkers outside, in university circles, in think tanks, because it seemed to me potentially a very mutually useful exchange. New people in academia need to 
you know what's happening and what people are thinking in the decision-making world, the decision-makers also have a considerable need of your ideas. What do I mean? You shouldn't underestimate how difficult it is in a big organization, the European Commission or a ministry somewhere, it's very difficult to launch new ideas. The force of inertia is very strong. And that's why I want to encourage you who have not only uh, the right to make independent criticism, but also a duty to make independent criticism, I invite you, I encourage you to contribute to public debate. Now, um, uh, I'm going to give you a very rapid visual overview of the past enlargement of the European Union. Uh, I'm going to begin by reminding you uh, about the basic dates when the European Union was created, and I think everybody agrees that one of the fundamental aims was to stop war. I mean more precisely, to make war between member states of the European communities and the European Union impossible. And in that sense, I think it's been a remarkable success at least for the younger generation, I think, the use of force between the member states of the European Union is something that simply doesn't exist in the last week. I don't think that the use of force in Europe is finished. We've seen, we've seen wars here in this region, and we recently saw Russia invade Georgia. But at least between the EU member states, um, it's been extraordinarily successful. Um, uh, I will refer, by the way, to the European Union rather than the European communities, um, partly because one of the not very well noticed consequences of the Lisbon Treaty is that the European communities have finally been abolished. I'm not sure how many people realise that since the 1st of December, the European communities, an excellent concept, is now a historical concept and we have to talk about the Union. Indeed, those of us who used to write about the wonderful community method or really to find another name. But I just wanted to say that um, uh, uh, for most of its existence, uh, countries have been knocking on the door of the European There have been very few years when there wasn't either an African country or a process of negotiation. Um, here it is, this was the beginning. Um, you might notice that at the bottom of the map there is a piece of Africa because at the time, Algeria was part of the territory of France. I think it became an independent about 62. Yeah. Then we increased uh, in 73, and you'll see that up at the top there is another important piece of land, which is Greenland. Um, at the time, uh, an integral part of Denmark, but um, nevertheless, Greenland subsequently left the European communities, I think in the 1990s, when again, it was on in the top in the answer of Greece, is then Portugal. This, of course, is the sign of the problem. This is the reunification of Germany, where the DDR, so to speak, running by the back door by the simple um, uh, method of joining another member state. Um, perhaps the simplest method of joining the European Union. Here we have after the enlargement, which brought in three new countries. 2003 way, 2007 way, and this is the situation today. Here we have a situation where we have altogether uh, seven African, prospective African countries, and I'll discuss them with the country. Let me share some thoughts with you about um, the why of the European Union's expansion. My thesis is that the expansion has taken place because countries wanted to join. The, the, the process at the beginning of the six was so magnetic that there have always been neighbors who wanted to join. One of the fundamental reasons, in my opinion, why the European Union <coughs> has been a stable and successful system of organizing the territory of Europe is that it's non hegemonic by which I mean that if you ask the question of the European Union, who's in charge, the reply is quite complicated. I mean, it is not one individual member state, that's the thought. The biggest member state, Germany, doesn't want to be in charge for historical reasons. 
There are two member states which would like to be in charge, that is the Germans and the French, who quite often uh, refer to the Franco-German axis, but it's interesting that they have rather limited success recently in, in, in pushing the others around. And I think this is a fundamentally important point, including for a country like Serbia, that this is not a system where there is a domination by one or two or a number of big partners. The, the institutional mechanisms of the European Union include this principle of um, <coughs> uh, digressive proportionality, which means that the smaller countries are overrepresented in the institutions. And I think this is a very precious element in, in the European construction that the small, medium sized countries have a kind of guarantee that they will not be rolled over by the big boys as they were on so many occasions in history. <coughs> I also want to underline that nobody went up from Brussels asking countries to join. I mean, you know, if anything, the discreet message is, well, don't apply just yet, uh, uh, just, just keep it for later. We have in Brussels enough problems uh, among existing members without wanting immediately to act to more. And <coughs> it's an interesting fact that at the beginning when the six created the European community, they, they didn't predict expansion. There were very few. What Robert Schumann was one, who envisaged one day that the Central East Europeans to join. But basically, well, let me make a comparison. In the United States in the 19th century, there was this concept, this slogan of manifest destiny, where it was almost the divine right of the USA to expand with an organizing project. That's never been the case in Europe. Indeed, many of um, the good European or European ideal things have seen a conflict between the process of enlargement and the process of European integration. That's the constant argument that why <coughs> is prejudicial to deepen it. Um, uh, so it's certainly the case <coughs> that the process has been reactive rather than proactive. Countries have tried to join the European Union because they think it's in their interest to do so. Uh, unless someone can correct me, I don't know of any case where a country joined, applied to join the European Union on the basis of analysis that showed it would be against its national interest. I mean, when the British joined, there were plenty of analyses <coughs> that showed that the direct costs, the direct budgetary costs, would be negative for the British. But there were also analysis showing that the indirect economic benefits, trade and so on, would be more than that. And on top of any economic considerations for the British, there was um, the political consideration uh, of, of gaining influence by joining us. So, so my thesis is that it's for African countries to decide whether it's in their interest, and if it's in their interest, then um, they should go for it. Let's consider what the treaties say about membership of the European Union. Well, ever since the beginning, ever since the first treaty, the Treaty of Paris in 1952, the texts have said any European state may apply to become a member. Now, it doesn't say any European state may become a member, uh, and I'll come on to the conditions in a moment, but it says since the beginning that any European state may apply without any attempt to define the geography. Later, and he was first to enter that treaty, there was a reference to values. And here you see in the Lisbon Treaty, uh, there's an even stronger reference to values. It's, it's an interesting nuance in the Lisbon Treaty that it's added these phrases. You not only have to respect the values, but you have to be committed to promoting them, which is very important. What are the values? Well, this is Article 2. Um, Article 2 has also been progressively, it's a highly negotiated text, but it's been progressively expanded in successive treaties. Uh, for example, it now includes gender equality. You'll note, however, that God or faith or religion is not mentioned. And as you know, this was quite a hotly disputed topic uh, during uh, the, 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 the European Convention. You could, of course, interpret tolerance as freedom of religion. But it's clear, clearly the case that in the treaties, 
the religious dimension is not a characteristic of, 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 of the treaty-based European Union. <coughs> now, it was in Copenhagen at the summit uh, in 1993 that for the first time the European Union laid down a specific criteria. Uh, later, some of these criteria were imported into the treaties, uh, the Amsterdam Treaty and now the Lisbon Treaty, um, uh, but they were first fixed in 1993. And there were three sets of criteria, uh, economic, uh, political first of all, and economic and administrative. Um, the political criteria, fulfillment of the political criteria, I don't say perfect fulfillment to a satisfactory extent is considered to be a precondition for opening negotiations. You don't have to finally conform to the second and third group of criteria until the moment of accession is near. But it's certainly the case that democracy, for example, has been seen as a precondition for opening negotiations. In 1997, the European Union said no to Slovakia, uh, not because it was in difficult economic conditions and was doing quite well, but because the government of Mecha had an interpretation, a practice of democracy, which the members of the European Union didn't think conform to their notion of what the European democracy should be. Anyway, these are the three main uh, criteria which have now been developed in an exhaustive catalogue uh, which candidate countries have come to satisfy. What I have showed you up to now demonstrates very clearly that, of course, membership is based on values. Um, but in my concept, the European Union was never designed for world government. As can be mentioned, it's sometimes seen as, or even projected itself as, a model for regional organization in other areas, but it always was expressly for European countries in a geographical sense. And it's interesting that the only case where Brussels said no to a potential candidate was Morocco. Um, that was in the late 80s. The King of Morocco wrote a letter to Brussels saying, um, I'm thinking of applying for membership. And this was very embarrassing because um, there was general consensus in the, in the institutions that Morocco is not European because it's plainly divided from the sky a lot of water. But, but how do you say no to a king? So, <laughs> they wrote, finally, they wrote a very polite letter saying, We love you and we want to see our relations. But they completely ignored the suggestion. <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to say that um, when you think about it for a moment, it's perfectly clear that logically expansion has to stop somewhere. If we don't know today where the fundamentals are, and we will know one day. Um, and I, I've always argued that membership is also based on geography. New members either have different contiguous or proximate. I, I use the word proximity because, of course, uh, four of the member states are islands, but they're not literally <coughs> to the members. If it were, people sometimes make Sunday speeches saying the European Union is above all based on values. If that was really true, then it seems to me we would be considering for the next membership, not necessarily Serbia, but countries like New Zealand. How did you see them? I don't know how many of you have been there. It's a country which has conserve and develop European values to an extent that shames many of us in Europe. <coughs> this is evidently a, a ridiculous absurd because it's on the other side of the world, and geographically it's not part of me. I'm going to reflect with you now a little bit uh, briefly about what I <coughs> consider as the geographical, historical and cultural roots of Europe. And let's have a look at the geography to begin with. Here is European geographical terms with mountains, seas, and rivers. Um, of course, in geographical terms, it's not too difficult on most sides of Europe. Um, it's quite well defined by the seas, by the Atlantic, by the Mediterranean. Uh, there are one or two borderline cases. I mean, 
Cyprus is actually on the junction of the tectonic plates of Africa and Eurasia, and the geographers sometimes say it's not part of the European continent at all. Iceland is on a raised part of the oceanic crust, and therefore it's a bit of a borderline case. Um, but of course the big problem with Bifurcation in the mix is, is the East. It's often said that modern Don, um, going back to our map, um, um, we just about see the Don, which is which is heading up there, but um, it's considerably west of the Ural Mountains. It was only Stralberg, who was a Swedish military officer, who made a survey, and Tatishev, who was the court geographer of the Great, who chose the Ural Mountains, and this was part of the explicit policy of, 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 of showing the expansion of Russia uh, and demonstrate that more and more of Russia was Western. Of course, some of the geographers contest that you're really talking about at all, and say that it's simply a uh, peninsula. Let's turn to the history. Um, which Europe is this? Um, well, this is the Roman Empire. Well, it's interesting to look at it. Um, uh, you know, you can see the large parts of the existing European Union were outside <coughs> the Roman political and economic space. Uh, most of Germany, all of Scandinavia, Scotland, Ireland. <coughs> and on the other hand, large areas um, were within uh, the Roman political and economic space. In the case of Turkey, the Middle East, and large parts of Africa. I show this to you because it's interesting, but I'm not sure it proves anything. I mean, you can go through history and examine the empire of Shanghai. Um, interesting because it corresponded largely, not perfectly, but largely to the six founding members of the European Union. You can say that the renaissance of the Enlightenment, cultural and historical phenomena, are determinant for the European identity. And of course, it's quite common. Um, Here's a map 
showing you uh, the Council of Europe. The dark yellow is the member states of the European Union, and the other yellow is the other members of the Council of Europe. I'm going to go through them rapidly to remind you who they are, with the 27 members of the European Union, plus the countries of this region, Turkey, a founding member of the Council of Europe. Um, I mean, if we accept Turkey as a country, it's very, very difficult to say no to any of the others. Then there's the, the EFTA group, uh, the countries of the Caucasus, and finally a number of smaller states. Now, if we try to look at this uh, from the point of view of drawing up a list of countries which might at least theoretically join the European Union, uh, we have to apply some correctness. Um, first of all, there's, there's Belarus, which well, is not in the Council of Europe. Um, manifestly would be accepted if it moved to a more democratic or a, better, a more acceptable regime. I think we rationally need to subtract the microstates, which I define as less than 100,000, not because I'm against them, I think they're greatly small countries, but when you talk to them, it's perfectly evident that at their size, they couldn't really handle the European Union. In a sense, Liechtenstein is a borderline case. Liechtenstein with 32,000 is quite successful. It has a representation in the United Nations, in Brussels, it conducts its international relations, but when you talk to them, they say, with 32,000, you couldn't possibly handle all those privileges and losses in the So, uh, I come to the conclusion that uh, we have 17 states which are recognized internationally to the UN, but aren't yet known. So, 17 plus 27 is 44. And my argument is this. It's not that these 17 states are destined one day to join the Union. It's simply that if they apply, we couldn't refuse them on the grounds that they're not European. The European Union could find plenty of other reasons for refusing them to begin with. Uh, we could say they're not ready. They have to make a criteria. You have to wait. You have to do the homework. We could say the European Union is not ready. The question of absorptive capacity. Um, so there's no obligatory the EU44, and indeed the arithmetic is subject to modification because um, new states may be created. I, I mentioned the possible here, perhaps rather provocatively. Even more provocatively, um, there's Scotland. Very much. Well, I'm not sure. There's Scotland, and in Belgium, there's a constant dispute about whether the Wallon and, and the Flemish are in get on together. So, all these are qualifications to the figure of 44, which I put in the table. Now, as I've already mentioned, um, the question accompanies each expansion, and it's a rational question on the part of the existing members. If we enlarge, will we make the European Union incapable of continuing to take decisions? Will we stop the dynamic of integration? I would need a separate session on this, but I'm just going to very briefly say that in my opinion um, the expected paralysis in 2004 or 2007 didn't happen. Now, I don't mean to say that institutions in Brussels work perfectly, but in 27 they worked about as well or as badly as they did before. The principal change is that of course with 27 it becomes more complex to fight decisions. Complexity isn't of itself a problem, uh, it just takes more time, I and mean, indeed, in the areas where you have qualified majority, it's not more difficult to get a qualified majority of 27 than it is of, of 15 or 12. The area in which, of course, you risk having problems is where they're even limited. You don't have to be a scientist to see that every time you add a new member, you increase the risk of paralysis due to the immunity. But experience shows very clearly that at least in the case of medium and small size member states, they don't use the detail. It's too expensive. They know that except in extremely limited circumstances, uh, they can't afford to be wrong. So my argument is that particularly now that the European Union is operating on 
continental scale, it is doing more than it could do less. Back in 93, uh, there was defined, we sometimes call it the fourth criterion, which referred not only to the African countries, but to the European Union's uh, so-called absorption capacity. I'm only going to make two comments on this text, which, first of all, I think the use of the word absorb was extremely unfortunate. It's, I'm not quite sure what it implies in French, but in English, it certainly implies a sort of liquefaction or disappearance of the member state, which is absurd. I mean, are the British less British than they joined the European Union? Are the French less French? Well, manifestly not. And I think it would have been more intelligent to use the phrase of accueillir or welcome. So perhaps we should talk about the welcoming of capacity. But I draw your attention also to the phrase maintaining the momentum of European integration. And this, uh, this of course, um, is something which relates to deepening and widening the wish to ensure that the European Union continues to develop. And the phrase used here, of course, is of a high level of, of generality. The momentum of European integration doesn't specify how it is to grow or in what fields. It's often interpreted, this phrase, as referring to institutional reforms. Now, I think that's too limited. For me, integration is, is not only about improving the institutions, it's even more about improving the policies. Therefore, for me, uh, one should also consider how it might be able to modify the policies of the European Union. The European Commission made a valiant attempt a few years ago to demystify absorption capacity, um, to, to stop it being used as a sort of blockage, particularly for the countries of the Western Balkans. But nevertheless, uh, at their meetings, the heads of state and government uh, still play um, taking account. Let me turn to today's situation. As you saw on the map which I showed you before, we have seven applicants for membership, and I put them here in the order. <coughs> um, I've made a reference here to the difference between candidates and potential candidates. Uh, I guess some of you understand <coughs> that the European Union has this rather strange etiolated uh, vocabulary where um, Serbia, despite the fact that the Union application on the this one in December, is not a candidate because uh, you can only become a candidate when the European Union gives you candidate status. How to admit personally, I find this rather absurd. And indeed, I have an appeal here to a philosopher. Jane Austen, who wrote this excellent book, How to Do Things with Words. For me, applying an application is a performative You know, whether they like it or not in Brussels, you've applied and you're an applicant. And for me, the word candidate is just a French version of applicant. But don't let's make a big story about these terminological differences. And, uh, let's simply note that there are different forms. And that accounts for the different colors on this map because, of course, it's the ones who are in the medium shape who, who are confirmed uh, with candidate status. Let me run through, <coughs> very briefly, um, the groups of countries which are knocking at the door. Um, <coughs> here, I want to draw your attention to the, the title of this slide, because there is a distinction which is made in Brussels between the next frontiers and the final frontiers. People are quite open in discussing the next frontiers in Brussels, but it's quite a big taboo in talking about the final frontiers. I also want to make a word of caution here about making predictions in this field. I sometimes remind myself <coughs> that um, in 1987 or 1988, if somebody had written a paper predicting that within 20 years uh, the European <coughs> Union uh, would be 27 members, they would have been treated as eccentric or deranged. And therefore, we must be a little bit modest in about our, our capacity to predict these events. We have three groups of countries which are in very different geographical situations. I mean, there's Iceland right up there at the extreme northwest, there's Turkey down at the extreme southeast, 
And you here in this region who are an enclave of the European Union. I mean, since the accession of Bulgaria and pneumonia, you are completely surrounded by the European Union. And in political terms and in terms of qualification for membership, these two groups are quite different, and one should be prudent about making generalizations concerning them. Let's have a look at Turkey. Uh, different in many ways. It's been waiting longer than anybody ever did, and it's also the biggest country that ever applied for membership of the European Union. Uh, it's not quite bigger yet than the reunified really really Germany, but one day measurably soon will become so because uh, the demographic predictions will easily take it up to 90 million, whereas the German population is in decline. I mentioned size, uh, I'm almost ashamed to say this because it, it is relevant, it, it's relevant to absorption capacity. Taking a big countries of the Union affects the balance of power between the big boys. And this is much trickier than accepting smaller, medium sized countries. I'm almost ashamed to say it, but it's easier for the European Union to accept small countries than big countries. And it's a, a valid question. Whether Turkey, which would be the biggest member state in the would be able to work and find the compromises necessary for the others. I'd like to ask the question when was it that the European Union last accepted a big member state? Oh, it was the British in 1973. Oh, it's a medium sum.
whereas you wasted time here. Still here in this region, there are uncertainty about the final definition of frontiers. There are enormous problems of governance, uh, governance of the rule of law, uh, judiciary system, and so on. And finally, there's the long tradition of the Balkans of depending on outsiders to impose the different decisions. And there are at least two cases still existing or protected, effectively, <coughs> Bosnia and Kosovo. But after recounting all these handicaps and problems, it seems to me there's no realistic possibility uh, except membership of the European Union. Thousands of trees have been cut down to produce reports on the problems of the Western Balkans. And I have not yet seen one of these reports which seriously proposed any alternative but using the European Union as a part of the membership. Let me touch on the case of Serbia since I'm a bit of a <coughs> And now I'm reflecting the language of Brussels, but what they see as the priorities for you <coughs> in qualifying for membership. And I've put a headline uh, the war crimes question and the general question of, of, of governance. Now I want to be objective and say that for what concerns these governance questions, the European Union now tends to be more rigorous than it was in the enlargements of 2004 and 2007. In the case of Bulgaria and Romania, and some of the others, we've been very disappointed by the condition in which they joined the European Union, and I personally had no hesitation in saying that we should have made the Bulgarians and Romanians work harder and stay outside longer in order to join the in, 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 in the better state. And, and that's just a fact that the European Union is tougher in this area than it was. For what concerns war crimes, I don't say it's tougher than it was. It's simply that in the past, we never had to deal with countries which were involved in questions of war crimes. It's a novelty in the accession process. Uh, and there, of course, is one of the most sensitive and difficult matters. We don't have what you could call an acquis in this area. But the view of the European Union is that Serbia and the others should comply with their international obligations. Of course, you need to do a lot of economic reforms. And as far as Kosovo goes, and I, as an outsider, I don't want to give you lessons on how to solve this terrible problem. I simply limit myself to saying <coughs> that um, the general view in Brussels is that we do not want new members with unresolved territorial disputes. That's always been the philosophy, although of course there have been exceptions. Uh, one of the exceptions are the nation, which is Cyprus, which most of us now deeply regret. It's sometimes overlooked that back in 1973, uh, when Ireland joined the European Union, the Irish constitution then expressly defined the Republic of Ireland is covering the whole of the island, including that piece of the United Kingdom, which is in Northern Ireland. But somehow the British and the Irish decided to ignore this problem. I mean, they just decided it wasn't worth having a contestation on this point, and uh, it could become a blockage to their joint union. Let's listen to the example of, of putting a potential problem uh, on one side in order to, uh, to ask it. I'm going to limit myself to this which is that, in my view, it's just <coughs> unrealistic to suppose that Serbia could join the European Union without finding what I tend to call a modest vivendi with Kosovo. I, I don't use the word recognition, which is tricky. I use the Latin word modus vivendi because it's capable of different interpretations. And I think both the Serbs and the Kosovars and the guys in Brussels have to use a lot of imagination and comprehension uh, to find a solution uh, for accession. I'm going on this slide to show you what I sometimes call forgotten enlargement because all three members of the EFTA group uh, have applied for membership. The Norwegians did it twice. The Norwegians twice signed accession treaties, but when the people said no. Uh, the Swiss were a bit more cautious. They made an application, and then when they got a no in a referendum on the European Union, then they withdraw, froze their application. 
Meanwhile, Iceland um, uh, is one of the latest contenders in 2009. I'm going to mention Iceland because although it's a long way from even Serbia, you're, you're both in the race to go. <coughs> you're both candidates of 2009. You need to keep an eye on what's going on. Arguably, Iceland is the best qualified candidate has ever been. You know, they, they have um, uh, in the Althing, the oldest parliamentary assembly in Europe. Uh, despite the economic crisis, it's still one of the richest countries in Europe in terms of GDP per head. Um, and I have to say that me as British, when I go from Brussels to my own country, I have to show my passport. Um, I have to show this passport thing which is went to my own country. When I go to Iceland from Brussels, I don't have to show a passport at all because it's in the Schengen zone. So again, this is an illustration. <laughs> Potentially the Iceland is facing problems because they are very positive to Brexit. Fisheries policy, I think personally, with an effort they could find a satisfactory deal in the negotiations. The common fisheries policy is undergoing in form. And if any intelligent reform can be agreed, it will go in the direction of Icelandic methods of conservation. I think the biggest problem they have in Iceland is simply the public opinion. Uh, they had a referendum there a few weeks ago on the bilateral problem, which brought out a very anti-foreigner, uh, xenophobic street. <coughs> and I think there's quite a strong risk of getting a really nice from action. Let me turn now to the final aspect of my presentation, which is the question of these uh, final frontiers. Now, I listed here uh, six countries in Eastern Europe uh, which are presently in the neighborhood policy. And that's the latest uh, foreign policy effort of the European Union, which indeed was enhanced in 2009 with the so-called Eastern Partnership that includes these countries. These are the six countries which are included in the Eastern Partnership. But although some of them are hopeful membership and are frustrated by the fact that the neighborhood policy refuses to say anything about accession, they're manifestly much, much further away from qualified membership than you hear in the Balkans. I mean, Moldova, Azerbaijan, Georgia are deeply involved in separatist conflicts. As far as Ukraine is concerned, it's not quite clear what policy line the new president will take. In general, the Ukrainians tend to say that they're in favor of membership in the European Union. But if you look at the population figures on this slide, you'll see that Ukraine comes well, almost in the big state category. Uh, so to put it another way, after Turkey, Ukraine is the only big state left, uh, which, which, which is an aspirant to, to manage. Uh, so it's unsure what will happen to these countries, and it's unsure what will Russia will do. Russia has been strident in refusing NATO membership of these countries. Um, Moscow has tended to think that the EU is more friendly or less dangerous. But perhaps they might change their way of thinking there also. I'm one of the very few who say that we can't exclude Russia, at least theoretically, from membership of the European Union. I mean, it's a European country, it's in the Council of Europe. And leaders on both sides have referred to Russia to the European Union. In the case of Yeltsin, we have a quite new how to account for his statements. Trying a bit too much. <laughs> was it trying to destabilize us? In the case of Berlusconi, I don't know what to say there. Berlusconi's ambitions are so fast. He, he recently made a speech in Israel saying his dream was for them to join. Anyway, it, it is a topic which has been mentioned. But to be more serious, I think it's doubtful whether it's feasible for Russia to join. I mean, it would be more like the European Union joining Russia in terms of population and land mass. And certainly under Putin, in terms of values, the Russians seem to be moving away from us, they're moving towards us. But I have to say that in the years when I was uh, one of the uh, 
planet foreign policy players in Brussels, I used to make the thought experiment of putting myself in the place of my homolog in Moscow, the guy in the Kremlin who was supposed to be looking into the future. I never identified precisely who or he or she was, but I'm sure it might exist. And if I was him or her, I would be saying, well, wait a minute, with 140 million, maybe we don't need to do it. Maybe we've got a catastrophic demographic decline. And sometime in the course of this century, we'll be near about 100 million. And over there in the East, we have 1,400 million Chinese. So, so maybe one day we should compose the beauty of the And I think that's not my generation or your generation gets to the distant future. Could we decide by decision of the European Union where the final countries should lie? Well, I don't think it's um, rational or desirable, and I, above all, it's not possible. Um, there are such different views among these system members. A consent enlargement is a field of policy where unanimity is the rule. I don't see how you get unanimity in the next country. It's quite rational for a member state to want its neighbour to join. I mean, it's quite practical to want a member to join because then he has to look after the external frontiers and not you. And according to this logic, it's perfectly normal that the Poles and the Hungarians should want Ukraine to be a member. And it's absolutely rational to that the Greeks shifted their policy to now in favour of Turkish membership. But of course there are other member states such as France which have a much more restrictive view of membership. In addition, it's not clear what the options are or what, what are, are their relationships with the European short membership which is stable and satisfactory. Uh, what if if Turkey doesn't join, what kind of strategic partnership will we define? How will the Eastern Partnership develop? So I, I don't think it's rational to force the countries to choose. But perhaps above all, to define the limits of the European Union now, we first of all discourage the states on the other side of the limit from aspiring to membership and taking on European regulations and norms. And it's quite surprising what sacrifices countries will make in that hope and the aspiration of one day to the European Union, even if it's not a guarantee. And um, it would also be the case, if we make a final definition of the frontiers, that the leverage for the states, including in the list of future members, would be really taken as a promise of membership rather than a conditional. So my final conclusion is that, um, that here I want to quote uh, a very distinguished British politician who indeed gave me my degree at the University of Oxford. I'm referring to Harold Macmillan. And Harold Macmillan had a famous interview with a journalist. The young journalist said to the Prime Minister, would you please tell me um, what are the principal factors that have affected your foreign policy? And he replied, events, dear boy, events. <laughs> so I think in, in looking ahead to the definition of the foreign policy, we have to take it events which are relatively unpredictable. The diplomats um, have adopted a rather cynical expression of constructive ambiguity. You can't be more cynical than diplomats. Um, but there's, there's some truth in this. Um, this is a diplomatic phrase for having or hoping for maximum leverage with minimum engagement. Um, I'm going to close with the last phrase on this, on this slide which is perhaps <coughs> more moral. I think that it would be an error, uh, it would not be in accordance with European values, for the existing members of the European Union to close the door. We should, in the long term, allow all the other Europeans to prepare, take part in the construction of our common rights. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I suppose we are very pleased uh, because of that change, that we are much more interested in the larger uh, process than in the role of the democracy, which is a larger issue, uh, generally speaking, but for us uh, it's a great privilege to be here from Sophie to speak about precisely this part. So, please, let's start the discussion. <coughs> Okay, to break the, uh, the ice, uh, just a very general uh, question. The other Europeans, of course, the, in the other Europeans, the phrase other Europeans, uh, in my perception, was a very clear uh, counterposition to uh, what we may think as a Mediterranean war. So it excludes the other side of the Mediterranean Sea as it has been shown in rejecting Morocco. Does it seem that in the further future you don't see any possibility to include countries around the Mediterranean into the Union, which <coughs> may be European, but some kind of common part? <coughs> Go back to the slideshow of the Roman Empire. And although there was a time when the countries of, of the northern, the southern shore of the Mediterranean and the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, the Middle East and North African countries, that they were part of what you might call the European economic space, I simply don't think that in the 21st century these countries are accepted not just by the but by the population of the Israel is a very interesting case. I mean, whatever views one may take about Israel foreign policy, you can't dispute that among the countries of the region, it's by far the most democratic. We got to this democracy. But, but it is a democratic state. Is it a European state? Some people argue that it is a European state um, because its creation was the result of terrible things that the Europeans did on their own territory, more or less obliging them to find a safer safety as what he meant a place to, to make their own state. And that, of course, the relation of the country a certain number of liberal and democratic and European values, I mean, not to mention the, the Judeo part of the Judeo-Christian uh, regime. It's a fact also that when the big enlargement took place in 2004, they had um, very serious discussions within the Israeli government about whether they should go to Trump. Uh, and they did these things in a very comprehensive way. And, you know, they got some intelligence about it. And they, they asked themselves the rational question if Israel joins, should John be a member too? Which is a very rational question. But not surprisingly, the Israelis came to the conclusion. I'm sure they come to the same conclusion today, that from their point of view of national security and strategy, the American party is so important, uh, they wouldn't want to leave the American uh, or the European in that government. Well, it, this was uh, very interesting. Uh, I just wonder <laughs> why you took that uh, approach rather than uh, more uh, say functional one because you didn't really discuss economic or, or, or security or political interest that, that may drive the enlargement of, of, of the EU concentrated more on geography, history and culture. And it seems to me that certainly one very significant part of the EU enlargement process is uh, the common market. So, and generally, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the trade and international integration is very, very fundamental to, to the whole project. I, for instance, remember a very good paper on Turkey by Dr. Turkey, from an economic point of view, is a, is a big country and demographic, demogra 
So if we were, for instance, to think about the trade terms, uh, if we had 10 years or so, uh, the, the, the trade, the integration of Turkey with the EU becomes very, very strong, as it seems to be the case, and, and then there is also a migration issue and demographic uh, complementarity. That may actually be more important than uh, whatever happened in, uh, in, in the Middle Ages. So I wonder why that one issue. The other issue is, let's say, 